Thank you, Carrie. Have you ever, have you ever what? Have you ever had a text or an experience or an in-person conversation or a phone call that left you with more questions than answers? You, you thought you were coming to a place of resolution and you walked away from it, whether it's an experience, a conversation, a text, an email, whatever it was, kind of shaking your head saying, now, what was that? What am I supposed to do with that? Some of you know our story, some of you don't, but Keely and I have known each other all of our lives. I don't remember not knowing Keely. Our mothers are and were the best of friends all of our growing up. So we spent every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night in the same church together, Sunday school or nursery, preschool, Sunday worship, Wednesday night, choir, hour upon hour every week. We were in different elementary schools, so we did have a brief reprieve during the day. <laughs> we get to junior high, we're in the same junior high. High school, same high school. College, same college. Her brother's a year older than us. We were good friends. We were together all the time. We never dated. I, it never crossed my mind or hers, I don't think, that we would ever be married. And we were just together all the time. Then we graduated from college, and she got a job, and I got a job. We were both living in Oklahoma City. And I became, I know it's going to sound weird, but impressed of the Lord that she was the one. I, I had been praying through junior high and high school. Yeah, I had dated a few people. You know I was a babe magnet. I mean, the women were just <laughs> all over me all the time. And so, you know, it's not like I didn't have other options, but I made it through all that. There's the truth, babe. Please don't ask her any questions after the sermon. But we, we wind up single and out of college. She's living with her folks. I'm living with mine. Isn't that every parent's dream? Put your kid through college and they come back home. And that's what we were doing. And it dawned on me that Keely was the one. And so I called her up and asked her to dinner. There was nothing strange about that. We had had literally thousands of dinners together. Our group of friends all ran together. Nothing seemed strange to her about that. But what was in my heart was we're going to have a conversation tonight that moves this thing forward and, and see where it goes. And so I get in my moon dust blue Lincoln Continental Mark VI. <laughs> it's like driving your grandmother's couch. And so <laughs> I drive over to her house, pick her up. We head to the Kona Ranch on Meridian. Anybody ever been? That's expensive. Now, that should have been a sign. We weren't at McDonald's. We weren't at Arby's. We had gone to the Kona Ranch, and, and we had a nice dinner, and I was trying to figure out the way to introduce the subject that I now know that you're the one for me, and I'm the one for you, and let's move this thing forward. I couldn't, the, the conversation never would land there. I mean, we just kept circling around, and so then I took her on a tour. You know, I kept driving and driving, and finally I just blurted it out. I said, now, I, I think you're the one for me. And I think if we were to start dating, that it's going to end in marriage. And I think if we're going to do that, you should not tell your mother, and I should not tell my mother, because if we start dating, and I think that it's going to end in marriage, and for some reason there's a twist in this story and it doesn't work out, I don't want them all mad at me. And so I would like for you not to tell your parents, and I won't tell my parents, We'll keep it all top secret, and we'll just sort of wade into it a little bit and see what happens. But I think if we were to start down this road, it's going to very quickly, you know, proceed, and we'll wind up married. In my mind, when that conversation happened, what I was going to hear is, Brent, I've been waiting to hear this all my life. <laughs> you are the most handsome, charming man I have ever seen. I respect and love and admire you so much. Let's get married and have a house full of children and live happily ever after. That's not how it went. <laughs> You're all shocked, as I was. <laughs> She's never been a big, big talker, but she didn't say anything. 
not a, well, that's nice, or I'm so flattered, or boy, that sounds good to me, or, you know, take me to the chapel. It was, hmm. (laughs) And so I drove her home, and she went in, and I left with a lot more questions than answers. I, I thought, in my mind, you know, that we would have then started dating, and she would have wanted to kiss me, and then we would have gotten engaged and gotten married, and it would have been wonderful, but nothing. In fact, about another year passes before she sees the great light and comes around to me. You want to know the rest of the story. It's worked out happily ever after. We're approaching 20 years, but it was one of those experiences where I walked away with a lot more questions than answers. We're going to deal with that in John chapter 20. When you walk away with a lot more questions than answers. When people talk about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, they rattle it off just like that, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, as if it all happened in a three-minute sitcom or 30-minute sitcom. He he was dead, he was buried, he was resurrected, and now he ascended to the right hand of God the Father. Boom, just like that. We're going to deal with just 10 verses in John chapter 20 in a moment, and you're going to see that it didn't happen quite that fast, lightning speed, death, burial, resurrection, ascension to the right hand of God the Father. When we tell the story, we know how it plays out. But Mary Magdalene, who goes on the first day of the week, did not understand what she was seeing, hearing, or feeling. When Mary Magdalene runs to Simon Peter and Simon Peter grabs John and these two start toward the tomb, they didn't understand or know or comprehend what was going to take place. And when we get to verse 10, you're going to find John and Peter going home with a lot more questions than answers. You might think to yourself, if I were Mary or if I were John or if I were Peter, And I got word that the tomb is empty, and I got to run to it and see for myself that it's empty. All my questions would have been answered, but the truth is that experience raised more questions than it provided answers in the initial moments of the empty tomb scene. You follow along as I begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 20, the gospel according to John. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark, and saw the stone already taken from the tomb. And so she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Verse 3, Peter therefore went forth, and the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb. And the two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping in and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Simon Peter, therefore, also came following him and entered the tomb and beheld the linen wrappings lying there and the face cloth, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up and placed by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb, entered then also, and saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the Scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes, going home with lots of questions. Father in heaven, this morning, from your text, we have heard your word. And now, Father, as we attempt to explain and dig deeper into what it is that you've said, We pray that you would enlighten us, Lord, that you would help us to understand what you were saying on that day and what you're saying on this day, Lord, that we might know you and serve you even better. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. When you slow down and you read just those 10 verses and you get to see the initial announcement that comes from Mary, it's simply these words, they have taken him away, the Lord out of the tomb. And we don't know where they've laid him. I want us to begin by considering what it is that those disciples, along with Mary, had heard, what they had witnessed, what they had seen, what they had felt. What is it that they had heard 
and seen and felt. You and I live this side of the cross, and so we know the victorious ending. But on this day, when Mary gets up to do a very heavy task for a man that she had loved and known so very well, and she goes to that tomb anticipating needing help to roll the stone away and finds that the stone has already been removed and there's no body inside. Her heart sinks. What is it that she announces? And how is it that John and Peter respond? What they hear is that the stone is rolled away. Not, he is risen. That, that's the Easter message. He's alive. I've seen Jesus. But what they hear is that the stone is rolled away. What they hear is that the tomb is empty. The body of Jesus Christ is no longer where Joseph and Nicodemus placed it. You remember last week. Joseph and Nicodemus take the body of Jesus from the cruel cross of Calvary, carry it to this tomb, a brand new tomb. And they take a hundred pounds of spices and oil and they wrap Jesus' body in those spices and oil and linen wrappings. Now there's a hundred pounds of spices and oil and all of that linen wrapping and the tomb is empty. The stone is rolled away. You're trying to digest this if you're Peter and John. Are some of those conniving thieves who gambled for the clothes of Jesus at the foot of the cross. Are they the ones who came and stole his body? Are some of those people who thought it was funny to make a crown of thorns and push it on his brow, are they now going to take his body and put it on tour like some sort of carnival show? What's going to happen? Those are the thoughts that have to be flooding their minds. The stone is rolled away. The tomb is empty. He's nowhere That body, he, is nowhere to be found. Not just as the stone rolled away and the tomb is empty, not only is Mary and Peter and John and anyone else in the right mind who would have heard this on this day thinking they've done something, but we don't know where they've taken it. We don't know what they're doing to his earthly remains. Where is Jesus? You've wondered, where is Jesus? Not unlike Peter and John and Mary, you're familiar with who he is, what he does, what he's capable of doing. You too have seen his miracles, read of his miracles, known of his power, just like the three of them. And you have the same question, that they, where is Jesus? What it is that they heard? They had seen the wrappings. Mary saw them. Peter saw them. John saw them. In order, Mary gets there first. Then John and Peter are in a race. And John gets there ahead. But John sort of hits the brakes when he comes to the tomb and he peers inside. Peter comes running up just moments later. He gets there. He goes on inside. He sees first the linen wrappings and the face cloth. Then comes John into the tomb. He sees the linen linen wrappings and the face cloth. There's something strange. If you're a thief and you're going to come steal the body, if you're a tomb raider, you're going to come in and grab it and go. You're not going to take the time while you're there to unwrap and deal with all of those spices, all of those wrappings. You're going to get in there under the darkness of night. You're going to grab, but they see something very strange. Wasn't the first time in their lives they'd seen something strange, but they're seeing something strange, and now they're dealing with this, all of this, all of these questions in their mind. You know they're forming Where is the body of Jesus? Who is it that could have done this? What are they now going to do? And why would they take the time, the risk, put themselves in danger and peril of being known? Why would they sit here and take all of the time? This is very strange. It's surprising. 
to walk in and see that. So very surprised. Something very suspicious. You read it. I read it. You've heard it before. Not only are the linen wrappings lying there, but the face cloth which had been placed on his head wasn't with the linen wrappings, it says in verse 7, but is rolled up in a place by itself. Huh. And they're noticing all these things. Not because they're CSI, but because they're very aware that this is where the Son of Man and the Son of God was laid. We're, we're still trying to figure it out, they would have had to have admit. They're still trying to understand and comprehend all the things that they've heard from Jesus, but they have had a front row seat to the teaching and preaching of Jesus, and they've heard. And so now they're seeing these very strange things. The linen wrappings lying there, the face cloth rolled up in a place by itself. Consider with me what it would have been that they felt. What would you feel if you had spent three years of uninterrupted fellowship and friendship with somebody? You've watched and listened as someone you know to be perfect, blameless, totally innocent, is convicted by a crooked system and pronounced guilty. You've heard a mob crying out, crucify, crucify, and you've watched in horror as this one that you've known so well is beaten and whipped and spat upon and cussed and nailed to a tree and crucified. You've been within earshot to hear his final words from the cross as he cries out, Father, into my hands I commit my spirit. It's finished. What do you feel in the moments as you receive word from a lady that you also know very well? The tomb is empty. They've taken him. I don't know where they've taken him or what they've done. And you think, perhaps this lady is so overcome with grief and sorrow that she's gone to the wrong place. Wouldn't you think that? You've got to be mistaken. There's no way that that tomb is empty. We know that Joseph and Nicodemus took Jesus there, that the stone was put in place. Maybe you're just at the wrong place. You haven't been there very often. Let's go see it for ourselves. And you go for yourself, and you verify it to be true. Perhaps they felt very afraid. Perhaps their neck starts spinning around like some old owl trying to look for who's coming after me. If they're willing to do this, they're thinking. If they're willing to come take his body, if they're going to do even more harmful, hateful, hurtful things. Maybe you feel anger. I think Peter would have, don't you? At least Peter. We're going to get him. The, the sun won't set before justice is brought to whoever came and took the body of Jesus. I'm, so, I'm infuriated that somebody would be so disrespectful, so cruel, so heinous, that they would come, take the, isn't it enough that they crucified him? Isn't it enough that they mocked him? Isn't it enough that they've made such a spectacle, such a scene over one who we know is innocent and blameless and perfect? And the anger begins to boil, perhaps. There's a sense of abandon, abandonment. When the one that you've always turned to for advice and counsel and wisdom, had they had a phone with a number to push for caller number one, number one on their speed dial would have been Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, what am I supposed to do when I find a tomb empty? But he's not there. They can't see him. They can't hear him. The one that they're most desperate to hear from, the, the voice that they would most like to hear, the counsel they would most like to receive, they can't in this moment. No doubt they felt confused. This just doesn't happen. Where, where do we look in the playbook to find the answer for this? What am I supposed to... Confusion. Curious. The Scripture tells us that they don't 
get it quite yet in verse 9 that he must rise again from the dead. But they have heard Jesus say words like, tear the temple down and three days later I'll build it back. And you know how it is when there's somebody that you love and respect and admire and you've seen their power and you've watched the mirror. All those, some of those words just start to flash back into their head. Some of those scenes in time perhaps start to come back and there's this curiosity. Could it be? Could it be? So they've got this confusion and curiosity going on and it's all this mix. But don't you know that they had to have felt crushed? What they would have thought is at least we'll have a place and we can go. That's why on all these 48 hours and 20 20s and 60 minutes when, when there's somebody that just disappears without a trace and they interview the parents or the spouse or the children, they say, we just need closure. We're willing to accept it. Whatever it is, of course we hope to find them alive, but after this many months or years or decades, we'd just like to know where are their remains. So we can, we would say in our culture, give them a proper burial. We'd like to be able to go, don't you know they were, cru- they were planning? We'll at least have a place where we can go back and we can remember. We can spend some time there. You've been there, not, not just like them, but some of the same feelings, some of the same thoughts, some of the same scenery. You've had the same question, where is Jesus? How am I going to get past this? I'm so crushed by what's taken place. And look at what has to happen in verse 10. That's what captivated my attention. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. They'd been at home. Mary Magdalene had come running. The tomb is empty. Mary, you've got to be mistaken, but we're coming. We're going to come see ourselves. And they get there and they see for themselves. And the the tomb is empty. But, But what do you do? Okay, the tomb is empty. And they go again to their own homes. It is interesting, and we'll see it in the coming weeks. Verse 11, Mary sticks around. God bless godly women, right? Mary sticks around, but Peter and John go back home. Going home with lots of questions. They left with questions that morning about their friend. Who has taken him? What have they done? Should we have done something different? You know how the questions come. The beauty of this sermon, and it'll end in just a few moments, is they left that Sunday morning with lots of questions. You don't have to leave with lots of questions. They left with questions about their friend. They left with questions about their faith. This would be a faith-rocking moment, right? And you've had in your life some faith-rocking moments where you had pictured the way that things were going to go. I pictured Keely getting down on one knee and giving me a big old diamond. You know, this is how it's going to be. You've pictured some things for your children and grandchildren. You've pictured things in our country or your workplace. You've had a picture and it didn't go according to the picture. And all of a sudden, your faith is shaken, rocked somewhat. When you put somebody in a tomb, you have a picture of how things are going to go. They had questions about their friend. You've had questions about Jesus. They had questions about their faith. Should we have followed or not? Were these last three years a waste? 
Was he really not who he claimed to be? Is he not able to do what he said he's able to do? Should we have followed or should we not? Questions about their faith. What do we do now? Some of you are there. What do we do now? Okay, we've seen it with our own eyes. It's not gone according to the way that we thought it would go. There's been a change in plan. It's surprising, it's shocking, there's something strange that's transpired. Now what do we do? What do we do now? I would suspect in some way all of us are there this morning. What do we do now? Peter and John don't throw up their hands and renounce Christ. They don't say this was all phony, this was all a joke, this was all make-believe. They just go back home. They wait. They keep on doing what they had been doing. And I would suggest to you that that's the best solution for each of us in all of our lives when we hit one of these scenes where we were just with Jesus. We were just with Jesus in the garden and we were praying and we heard him. We were just with Jesus as he told Pilate, I am the great I am, I do have all of the power, all of the authority. You would have none if I didn't give it to you. We were just with Jesus and we saw him put that guy's ear back on his head. There's no denying what we've seen. There's no denying what we've heard. There's no denying what we felt. And now we don't see Jesus and we don't hear Jesus and we don't feel Jesus. And we wonder, what am I supposed to do right now? Just hang on a minute. Just hang on. Jesus is still at work. Jesus is still on the scene. Jesus is still the Messiah, the great I am, the Son of Man and the Son of God. And He is getting ready to make an appearance and we know it from Scripture. And most of us know it from personal experience. But that doesn't keep us from being in a similar situation at points in life of Peter and John where you shrug your shoulders and you wag your head and you say, wow, I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't expecting to go see an empty tomb with linen wrappings and a faith cloth all rolled up. They left with questions about their future. Where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? Some of you have had the unfortunate circumstance of having a spouse that was alive one day and promoted to heaven the next, and you have to wake up the next day and you say, well, where do we go from here? Some of you have walked into a doctor's office, having done so dozens of times, taken some sort of physical test, sat down and heard words that cut you to the core. Inoperable, we're going to need treatment, or this, that, or the other. And the world doesn't stop because you've had a bad day. They send you to reception, want to collect the copay, and send you out to your car. And you say, well, what do we do now? You've lost loved ones and family members. You've had job situations that have shifted. And the questions come about the future. Okay. So what do we do now? They've seen it. They haven't just heard from Mary that the tomb is empty and the body can't be found and we wonder where it is. They got there themselves. There's no denying what they've seen. It's empty. That's the right tomb. Those are the wrappings that were on Jesus. We haven't heard from him. We haven't seen him. Where do we go from here? And what does this mean for us? You know they were wondering, what does this mean for us? Why did they go home? Well, it was the safest place they knew, probably. Where do we go from here? And what does this mean for us? Going home 
with lots of questions is something that Peter and John had to do some 2,000 years ago on a Sunday morning. Going home with questions is not something you have to do in 2019 on a Sunday morning. You can know where Jesus is. You can know what happened to that body. You can know what it is that he has to say. You don't have to leave this experience, this sermon, this worship service, this conversation with God. You don't have to leave with questions. He's got the answer. So you can reflect on life and think of many times when you'd say, man, I was expecting this to go one way and it went some way totally different. Or I was expecting this to bring some resolution, some clarity, to bring things into focus, and now everything is just a blur, and I've got more questions than I do answers. If you've come to this worship service and listened to this sermon and studied this scripture with us, and you will know the Jesus Christ of scripture, you don't need to leave here with more questions than you do answers. You need to leave here with the answer. Curtis shared it with us. Jesus said, I'm it. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. I'm going to pray for us in just a moment. As I'm praying, what's supposed to happen when I'm praying is that you're praying too. You, you really don't need to listen to a word I'm saying as I'm praying to God. I can only pray for myself. If you need to overhear my prayer, well, if you're listening to my prayer, then listen for things that would prompt you to pray something similar. Say, yes, God, I agree with that, or yes, God, I would like that, or yes. But as I'm praying, you're praying. And as you hear from God, he may be drawing you to the Franklin Baptist Church to unite with his church family. That's wonderful. You come during the invitation time. He may show you that you're already a believer. You put your faith and trust in him, but you know you've never followed him in believer's baptism, and you know that would be a wonderful step of faith. You come forward during the invitation time, and we'll make plans for your baptism in just over a month. We'll have a, a big time on a big Sunday in May. It could be that you don't know Jesus Christ personally. You know about him. You've heard about him. In fact, what he says in verse 9, for as yet they did not understand. You, you might be in a similar situation. As yet, you're curious, you're interested, you're warm to the idea of Jesus Christ, but you don't totally understand yet. could be that today you understand. That all of this becomes crystal clear. That you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And Jesus Christ is the only one that can forgive you of your sins and cleanse you of your unrighteousness. Give you salvation and forgiveness. Receive you into a fellowship with Him. I'd invite you to come during that invitation time. Don't leave here with more questions and answers. Don't go home unresolved the way that Peter and John had to all those years ago. You can leave here knowing where he is, what he's doing, and how he lives. Father in heaven, thank you for today. Thank you for the privilege of opening your word. Thank you for the truth that's contained in these pages, that's alive, that cuts to the core of who we are. Father, you're speaking to men and women and boys and girls right now. Their prayer, like mine, is that your will would be done in my life Lord if there's an unconfessed sin that I'm unaware of or that I've kind of pushed back and pushed back Lord I pray that your Holy Spirit would bring great conviction upon me about any sin that I need to confess if there's an area of obedience that I need to follow you in Lord show me that area of obedience if there's an area of disobedience that I need to repent of Lord I, I want to know it I want to leave here this morning in right relationship with you. My prayer for the people in this room is that they're asking you right now, what do you want from me? If there's some who are searching for a church home, Lord, I pray that you give them clarity about the place that they should serve and minister. If there are some who have already put their faith and trust in you, and have yet to follow you in baptism, I pray that they would step forward and make a public profession of their faith and trust in your son Jesus Christ and allow us to make plans for that baptism. Lord, for the one or many 
who have yet to put their faith and trust in your son Jesus to know you personally through his shed blood in that empty tomb. Lord, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand and sing, would you please respond as the Lord leads?